know our chemical composition. We know we are made out of the same elements as the rest of the cosmos. In fact, rather more accurately, if you want to call it that, we're even made out of stardust. Stars had to die for us to live. So we think it's overwhelmingly probable that when we die, our chemical ingredients will return to the, the natural the biological and biochemical cycle, and there seems no evidence to the contrary. But maybe uh, animals uh, who know how to fear death, there's certainly no animals who know how to deny it. That's why it's so interesting that among the most frequently asked questions of people to their priests and mullahs and rabbis about the afterlife is, will my dog or cat be there too? Um, and you notice they only ask that, will Timmy be in heaven or river? They never say, will that hellish tabby I once had um, be reassembled in the infernal regions? This is enough to show how wishful the thinking is. Now I see that surely has Dinesh's um, clever but I think thin book on the case for the afterlife in front of him. In, in one debate that I had with Dinesh, he, he briefly gave me pause by saying, yes, wishful thinking for heaven, all right. That's hedonistic, that's a hope, that's a desire. But then why would people who were wish thinking, why would they want help? Good point, and it, it's, and it, it tells against simple-minded Freudianism, uh, as does a lot of other evidence. But not all of our wishes are completely transparent to us, I think, and not all of them are hedonistic, especially as they respect or regard other people. I was one of the two or three white people in the audience at Madison Square Garden in 1985 when Louis Farrakhan gave his famous address to a packed house of the Nation of Islam and addressed the Jews of, of the greater New York, New York area in a taunting manner and reminded them, and I'll never forget it, he said, uh, and remember Jews, when God puts you in the ovens, it's forever. And I shall not soon forget the great moan and groan of pleasure that came from that audience of hearing that. And I should have been prepared for it, not just by the stupidity and nastiness and criminality on which this religious nutbag makes his living in this country. Call someone an imam or a priest or a reverend, there's nothing they can't get away with in our culture. <laughs> If I could change one thing, it would be that. The second would be when someone gets up and says, I'm a person of faith, then they don't get respect for it. They expect, they think that's a respect producing statement. I am a person, you know, I'm a person who will believe practically anything or no evidence at all. <laughs> well, you say it, mister. Respect comes later. Um, I digress. I shouldn't have been surprised by this orgy of sadism and cruelty and gloating from Farrakhan's religious audience because I've read the Christian Fathers. I've read Tertullian, who, answering some questions, one of the great fathers of the church, we see why hell is unpleasant. Why is heaven such fun? It seems to be rather dutiful. Endless praise, endless worship, endless subjection, uh, endless tedium. Uh, you think that the Lord himself, after the first five billion years, would have had enough of the songs of praise. No, it's got to go on forever. Okay, where's the good bits? So Tertullian says, we thought of the good bits. In the intervals of that, you can go to the edge, and you can go and look down and gloat on the torments and endless tortures of the town. We've thought of that. Now, excuse me, that is a founding statement of Christianity. You can't disown it now. These churches wouldn't be here oppressing us. These mosques wouldn't be here incubating madmen and suicide bombers. There wouldn't be mad Jewish settlers on the West Bank thinking if we could only steal other people's land and bring on the Messiah and Armageddon, everything would be all right. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything like this if it was left to the rabbi, if it was left to the rabbi and myself, but it's not. And the, his, the Joseph Ratzinger, who's his holiness the Pope, who just got off the plane in England today to announce that atheists are Nazis. <laughs> an overdressed little ponce who was himself a member of the Hitler Youth. <laughs> um, they hold your applause for heaven's sake. Uh, well now, in fairness, no one was arguing that religion should or will die out of the world. Um, 
And all I'm arguing is that it would be better if there's a great deal more by way of an outbreak of secularism. Um, logically, if Tony's right, it, I would be slightly better off, not much, but slightly better off, being a Wahhabi Muslim, um, or a Twelver Shia Muslim, or a Jehovah's Witness, than I am wallowing as I do in mere secularism. I'm, so, well, I'm arguing, I'm really serious, is what we need is a great deal more of one, and a great deal less of the second. And I knew it would come up, that we'd be told about charity. And I take this very seriously. Um, because we know, ladies and gentlemen, as it happens with the first generation of people who do really, what the cure for poverty really is. It eluded people for a long, long time. The cure for poverty has a name, in fact. It's called the empowerment of women. If you... If you... If you... If you give women some control over the rate at which they reproduce, if you give them some say, take them off the animal cycle of reproduction to which nature and some doctrine, religious doctrine, condemns them. And then if you'll throw in a handful of seeds perhaps and some credit, the floor, the floor of everything in that village, not just poverty, but education, uh, health and optimism will increase. It doesn't matter, try it in Bangladesh, try it in Bolivia, it works, works all the time. Name me one religion that stands for that, or ever has. Wherever you look in the world and you try to remove the shackles, of ignorance and disease and stupidity from women, it is invariably the clerisy that stands in the way. Or in the case of um... <laughs> Now, third of all, if you're going to grant this to Catholic charities, say, which I would hope are doing a lot of work in Africa, if I was a member of a church that had preached that AIDS was not as bad as condoms, I'd be putting some conscience money into Africa too, I must say. <laughs> But it won't bring my joy. I'm not trying to be funny. I, if I was trying to be funny, you mistook me. It won't bring back the millions of people who've died wretched deaths because of that teaching. That still goes on. I'd like to hear a word of apology from the religious about that, if it was on offer. <coughs> After all, otherwise I'd be accused of judging them by the worst of them. And this isn't done, as Tony says so wrongly, in the name of religion. It's a direct precept, practice, and enforceable discipline of religion. Is it? Not so, in this case. I think you'll find that it is. But if you're going to say, all right, um, the Mormons will tell you the same. You may think it's a bit cracked to think that Joseph Smith found another Bible buried in upstate New York, <laughs> but you should see our missionaries in action. I'm not impressed. Um, I'd rather have no Mormons and no missionaries, quite honestly, and no Joseph Smith. Um, do we grant to Hamas and to Hezbollah both of whom will tell you and incessantly do. Look at our charitable work. Without us, if any, the poor of Gaza, the poor of Lebanon, where would they be? But for our, and they're right. They do a great deal of charitable work. It's nothing compared to the harm that they do, but it's a great deal of work all the same. I, uh, I'm also familiar with the teachings of the great Rabbi Hillel. I even know where he plagiarized the story from, if he had access to the stuff. The, inj the injunction not to do to another what would be repulsive done to yourself is found in the Analects of Confucius, if you want to date it. But actually it's found in the heart of every person in this room. Everybody knows that much. We don't require divine permission to know right from wrong. We don't need tablets administered to us ten at a time in tablet form on pain of death to be able to have a moral argument. No! We have... We have the reasoning, we have the reasoning and the moral suasion of Socrates and of our own abilities. We don't need dictatorship to give us uh, right from wrong, and that's my lot. Thank you. Hitchens on uh, circumcision. Enjoy. <laughs> the guy who cheats on his wife and doesn't get caught and thinks he's really clever and he's pulled it off will never know what it really feels like to invest all of your love in a single relationship. You pay for everything you take in life in one currency or another. And sometimes when the bill comes due, you go back and wish you'd played it differently. Professor, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. 
I, I once said that the uh, rabbi had given me a wonderful definition of the word envy. I envied his royalties. And uh, <laughs> there was a sense in which he spoke and does speak to the fundamental question that we all ask. But I would write a slightly different book. My book would be, why do good people do wicked things? And the church is full of good people who are tempted and actually sometimes succeed in doing wicked things. Now, my tradition teaches that the, the, the doctrine of original sin sort of explains everything. You're all naturally wicked and you'll do wicked things unless you're inhibited against them. Uh, which provides a very rational theology, but wouldn't preach it well these days, especially I'm sure in Hartford, Connecticut. But the fact of the matter is the greater question for me is people who want to do the right thing, want to, do, want to be thought of as good and virtuous, often end up doing terrible things. And I think St. Paul's famous line, the good that I would do, that I do not, and that which I would not do, that I do. That's the human and the moral uh, uh, dilemma. And it seems to me that's the task to which, you know, confession, forgiveness, amendment of life, all of that is directed towards. So that would be my take, but I don't think my book would do as well as Rabbi. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, there are things that a normal, morally normal, even a very morally average and mediocre person would not unprompted do, for example, hold down their daughter at the age of six, tear off her underwear and cut her genitalia with a sharp stone. They wouldn't do that if they didn't think God was telling them to do it, or the mullahs, or the, if it's a boy, the rabbis weren't telling them to do it. Um, one of the reasons why I have the lurid subtitle I do of my book, The Religion is a Poison, is that it makes ordinary moral people, uh, compels them, forces them, in some cases orders them, to do disgusting, wicked, unforgivable things. There's no expiation for the generations of misery and suffering that religion has inflicted in this way and continues to inflict, and I still haven't heard enough apology for it. Christopher, I've, I've got to call you down on refer, referring to circumcision as genital mutilation. My son cried more at his first haircut than he did at his bris. And statistically... He's doing it right then. <laughs> statistically, the, the only long-term effect that it seems to have on people is it increases their chances of winning a Nobel Prize. I can't, um, I can't find the... the um, compulsory uh, mutilation of the genitals of children are subject for humor in that way, or flippancy in that way. Maimonides says very plainly that it's designed to repress uh, sexual pleasure, to deprive us of a male child as far as possible of the opportunity of that. Uh, the full excision, um, uh, not just the snip or the, the mind, the full mandatory, mandatory covenant is, is fantastically painful. Uh, leads to trauma, um, leads to the dulling of the sexual uh, relationship, and uh, can be in itself a life threatening. At that moment, we have the records, I can show them to you, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in the United States of boy babies who've died or, or had life threatening infections as a result of this disgusting practice. That you, that a person as humane as yourself, can sit here. And be, I think that that is a fit subject for humor, shows what I mean. Religion makes morally normal people say and do disgusting and wicked things. And you've just proved my point for me. Shame on you for saying what you just said. Shame on you for saying it about your own son, my God. Let's move on. Yes, let's. What next? Cutting the labia of little girls. At least Judaism doesn't do that. This is a question. What, what, if, what if a Muslim was to say to you just now, my little girl cried more at her first haircut than when I cut off her clitoris. What would you think of me if I was to say such a disgusting thing? Well... Remember, we are not talking about detail here. We're talking about whether religion makes people behave better or not. Let's and give I, the I rabbi a chance. 
Yes. I want to so, move on, but let's give the rabbi a chance to respond to right. that because it got pretty personal here. So. Again, my experience in my own son, my own grandson, hundreds of congregants has been that it's not nothing like what you're talking about and that for whatever reason that this has become an issue for you, uh, I just think is, uh, is excessive. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? That I'm more personally... Well, there's not a ton of innuendo to this. Let's bring it on. No, there's no innuendo there. What I'm saying is, sure. you know, I've lived through this personally and... You've uh, inflicted it is what you're saying. I do what? You've inflicted it or officiated at it is what you're saying, isn't it? Well, officiated, yes. Inflicted, no. Hmm. Uh, forget my Maharajis. My Maharajis has his hang ups about it. I should forget my Maharajis since when do you say that? Because on issues of sexuality, my Maharajis has some very medieval ideas. Uh, I ran across the line in your book that Orthodox Jews have sex through a hole in a bed sheet. Do you know Orthodox Jews who told you they have sex that way? No, no, no. I say it is said of Orthodox Jews that they may do that. Right, gentlemen, I'm sorry it, to break this up. That's a, that's a reformed Jewish uh, rumor about Orthodox. We have a lot of questions from the audience, and I want to give others a chance. Gen um, genital is mutilation is no joke. Love the guy. Michael, ethnic bias. I've no grudge of that sort. I can rub along with pretty much anyone of any, as it were, origin or sexual orientation or language group, except people from Yorkshire, of course, um, who are completely untakeable. Um, and I'm beginning to resent the confusion that's being imposed on us now, and there was some of it this evening, between uh, religious belief, uh, blasphemy, ethnicity, profanity, and what one might call multicultural etiquette. It's quite common now for people to use the expression, for example, anti-Islamic racism, as if an attack on a religion was an attack on an ethnic group. The word is now referred here, in fact, is beginning to acquire the opprobrium of the uh, that was once reserved for racial prejudice. This is a subtle and very nasty insinuation that needs to be met head on. Who said, What if Falwell says he hates fags? What if he will act upon that? The Bible says you have to hate fags. If Falwell says he's saying it because the Bible says so, he's right. Yes, it might make people go out and use words. What are you going to do about that? You're up against a group of people who will say, you put your hands on our Bible or we'll call the hate speech police. Now, what are you going to do when you've dug that trap for yourself? Uh, somebody said that anti-Semitism and Kristallnacht Act in Germany was the result of 10 years of Jew baiting. 10 years? You must be joking. It's the result of 2,000 years of Christianity based on one verse of one chapter of St. John's Gospel which led to a pogrom after every Easter sermon every year for hundreds of years because it claims that the Jews demanded the blood of Christ be on the heads of themselves and all their children to the remotest generation. That's the warrant and license for and incitement to anti-Jewish pogroms. What are you going to do about that? Where's your piddling subsection now? Does it say St. John's Gospel must be censored? Do I have read Freud and know what the future of an illusion really is and know that religious belief is ineradicable as long as we remain a stupid, poorly evolved mammalian species? Think that some Canadian law is going to solve this problem? Please. No, our problem is this, our prefrontal lobes are too small, and our adrenaline glands are too big, and our thumb-finger opposition isn't all that it might be, and we're afraid of the dark, and we're afraid to die, and we believe in the truths of holy books that are so stupid and so fabricated that a child can, and all children do, but as you can tell by their questions, actually see through them. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. Now let's not dance around. Not all monotheisms are exactly the same at the moment. They're all based on the same illusion. They're all plagiarisms of each other. But there's one in particular that at the moment is proposing a serious menace not just to freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but to quite a lot of other freedoms too. And this is the religion that exhibits the horrible trio of self-hatred, self-righteousness, and self-pity. I'm talking about militant Islam. Globally, it's a gigantic power. 
globally it's a gigantic power, it controls an enormous amount of oil wealth, several large countries and states uh, with, a, with an enormous fortune, it's pumping the ideology of Wahhabism and Salafism around the world, poisoning societies where it goes, ruining the minds of children, stultifying the young in its madrasas, training people in violence, uh, making a cult of death and suicide and murder. That's what it does globally. It's quite strong. In our societies, it poses as a cringing minority whose, whose faith you might offend, which deserves all the protection uh, that, that a small and vulnerable group might need. Now, it makes quite large claims for itself, doesn't it? It says it's the final revelation. It says that God spoke to one illiterate businessman in the Arabian Peninsula three times through an archangel, and that the resulting material, which as you can see when you read it, is largely plagiarized from the Old and the New Testament. Almost all of it actually plagiarized ineptly from the Old and New Testament is to be accepted as a divine revelation and as the final and unalterable one and that those who do not accept this revelation are fit to be treated as cattle, infidels, potential chattel, slaves and victims. Well, I tell you what, I don't think Muhammad ever heard those voices. I don't believe it. And the likelihood that I'm right, as opposed to the likelihood that a shepherd who couldn't, a businessman couldn't, who couldn't read, had bits of the Old and New Testament re-dictated to him by an archangel, I think puts me much more near the position of being objectively correct. But who is the one under threat? The person who promulgates this and says, I'd better listen because if I don't, I'm in danger? Or me, who says, no, I think this is so silly, you could even publish a cartoon about it. And up go the placards, and up go the yells, and the howls, and the screams. Behead those. This is in London. This is in Toronto. This is in New York. It's right in our midst now. Behead those. Behead those who cartoon Islam. Do they get arrested for hate speech? No. Might I get in trouble for saying what I've just said about the Prophet Muhammad? Yes, I might. Where are your priorities, ladies and gentlemen? You're giving away what's most precious in your own society, and you're giving it away without a fight, and you're even praising the people who want to deny you the right to resist it. Shame on you while you do this. Make the best use of the time you've got left. This is really serious. Now, if you look anywhere you'd like, because we've had invocations of a rather dribbling and sickly kind tonight of our sympathy. What about the poor fags? What about the poor Jews? The wretched women who can't take the abuse? And the slaves and their descendants and the, and the tribes who didn't make it and were told that their land was forfeit. Look anywhere you like for the war and for slavery, for the subjection of women as chattel, for the burning and, and, and uh, flogging of homosexuals, for ethnic cleansing, for anti-Semitism, for all of this, you look no further than a famous book that's on every pulpit in this city and in every synagogue and in every mosque. And then just see whether you can square the fact that the force that is the main source of hatred is also the main caller for censorship. And when you realize that you're therefore this evening faced with a gigantic false antithesis, I hope that still won't stop you from giving the motion before you the resounding endorsement that it deserves. Thanks awfully. Night night. Stay cool. Okay, thanks for watching this video. Hope you got something out of it. Now, if you would like to support my channel, please go to my Patreon and sign up for a dollar or five. It's, it will really be helpful and uh, in this process that I'm rebuilding, it would be great if you did. So with this, I hope you, I see you in the next video. I will keep on uploading on this channel. Okay, stay cool and keep painting.